Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today, we have another set of great stories about crazy people and their revenge for you to enjoy. Subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. To the story. High End Revenge In the late 80s, I was working tech support at a cash register company in a well-known resort area, so I was well familiar with the etiquette of on-site servicing of higher-end establishments. One day, I got a service ticket for probably the highest high-end resort in the area. If you aren't in the 1%, you aren't getting in. Their bar printer isn't working. So I get out there, it's fairly high up in the hills, great view, but a pig to drive to when you're in a hurry, and the restaurant manager lights into me about how my gear always breaks and how crappy our service is, etc. This is in the lobby in clear view of the diners at their lunch rush. I think he was trying to be a big dog in front of these people who could literally afford to buy islands. So I take about three minutes of abuse and get to work. The problem's fairly obvious and easily fixed, and after 10 minutes or so, I get it up and running. The backlog of tickets starts spewing out, and everyone's happy. So I go up to the manager to get him to sign off on the work order, and he bellows out, Well, did you fix it? What was wrong with it this time? I hold up a well-chewed cable and in my best stage voice say, Mice! His face went from smug slash snotty to frosty blank. Without another word, he hustled me off to the kitchen to sign my paperwork. I used his phone to call my office for my next job. Remember, it's the 80s, no cell phones back then. And by the time I got my tools loaded into the truck and start heading down the road, a van for a national brand pest control company is driving up. I found out later from the line cook that one of the guests in earshot at the restaurant was the CEO of the same national brand company. Apparently, he had a malicious sense of humor and wanted to rub the manager's nose a bit, too. I thought for sure I'd get flack for that stunt, but I never heard another word, and we kept that contract until the company closed. And our next story. Threaten my job after raising safety issues? Enjoy the Ministry of Labor breathing down your neck. This happened earlier this year and is still ongoing. I was in my final year of college, in order to pay for textbooks and other school fees, I applied to a furniture company that's very popular in Canada. A new location, which was going to be an outlet, was opening up. The building itself wasn't even ready yet, so they were hiring ahead of time. Within days of applying, I managed to get an interview with the store manager, who we'll call Karen. At first, she appeared to be a great and understanding manager who'd worked her way up into the company. During this interview, Karen went over what was required of me. As a sales associate, I was required to cash people out, clean the sales floor, restocking, the usual stuff. Part of our training involves health and safety, which is something this company took very seriously. We were encouraged to watch out for our coworkers and had a hotline to report any unsafe activity. When I asked about restocking, Karen assured me and my colleagues that we would not be responsible for bringing shipments onto the sales floor and wouldn't have to lift anything over 50 pounds. The company had a warehouse attached to our location, so the workers were supposed to help us bring in new stock. Now, the furniture at our location came from damages of stores around the country, which is why they ended up at our store. The furniture in question isn't simply stools and light furniture. We're talking sofas, sectionals, solid wood dining tables, beds, dressers, and sideboards. Really heavy stuff. A lot of this stuff has glass, which of course doesn't ship well. No problem for the warehouse dudes because they have the necessary equipment to lift heavy things and have heavy boots. So opening week comes and the warehouse guys do their bit, bringing in furniture when we request it. This goes on for about a month. During this time, Karen is hyping us up and telling us how proud she is of us and even organized a few pizza parties to reward us. We begin to see Karen as the best manager ever. She knows the struggles of working in sales and is very understanding, creating schedules to fit around our classes as many of us were still attending college. Then the honeymoon's over. After the first month, the warehouse guys no longer show up, basically leaving the furniture at our back door and leaving. Karen then explains to us that we'll now be responsible for taking the furniture into the store. There were several issues with this. All sales associates were required to adhere to a strict dress code of business attire, which includes slacks slash skirts, button-ups, and flimsy flats and or heels. 
We had no safety equipment to protect us from broken glass and other hazards of damaged furniture. We were never trained to properly transport furniture. Some pieces required the use of a rickety 10-foot ladder to which no safety harness was attached and would wobble if you so much as breathed too hard. I'm sure you can imagine how difficult it would be to move over a 200-pound sofa dressed in a pencil skirt or balanced on a ladder to put a large canvas on the wall. I decided to approach Karen with my concerns. Seeing as how she'd been understanding to other issues and was easy to talk to, I thought she'd be the right person to talk to. She wasn't. It's just a little lifting, pessimistic Penny. You honestly can't do that? She asked loudly. Despite this conversation taking place in the back room, I was later told it was very audible from the sales floor. I pointed out that we had originally been told we would only be required to lift 50 pounds. No one had ever warned us we would be required to move furniture around a 3,000 square foot facility. Well, if you're not willing to step up and help out, pessimistic Penny, Karen said, I'm not sure if you're the right fit for the job. Stupidly, I spoke up. I just want to be safe while I'm working. She then retorted with, If you call the hotline, I'll know it was you. This is a great place to work, and I'm still getting lots of applications. Just something to keep in mind. After that incident, Karen was a lot less understanding towards me. She cut my hours down, turning the majority of my shifts into on-calls. While not technically legal, my paycheck took a big hit. Being broke and pretty ignorant of my rights, I kept my mouth shut until I was injured on the job. While I was moving some furniture, a sofa stacked on its end tipped towards me. To stop it from completely falling on me, I pushed it away and ended up injuring my wrist. It wasn't until I went to the doctors that I find out I had sprained my wrist badly, requiring me to keep a wrap on it at all times. When I showed up to work with the wrap, Karen insisted I get a doctor's note to prove I wasn't faking the injury. Despite removing the wrap myself and showing her my very swollen and purple wrist, she denied it. When I did show up with a doctor's note, which cost me two hours of pay at minimum wage, she dismissed it as being a forgery and told me if I wanted to keep my hours, I'd better figure out how to work with one hand. That was the final straw. By this time, it was the start of the second month of the store being open. Since I ruined the aesthetic of the store with my injury, I was sent to the back to receive stock the very place I'd gotten my injury in the first place. Keep in mind, I was still required to stick to the dress code, but this gave me an opportunity. While I searched for another job, I began to document everything. Every broken mirror or door that rained shattered glass, every defect that could cause an injury was photographed, timestamped, and noted. I compiled this into a document, also included Karen's threats of me firing and her dismissal of my injury. It became like another job to me. On my off days, I would attend interviews. When the third month started, my probation period was over and all staff were all required to meet with Karen to see if the company wanted to keep us on. A few days before my review, I had received a call from a company that had interviewed me earlier in the week and wanted to hire me with a higher salary. Now I had nothing to lose. I sent all of my documentation and evidence to the Ministry of Labor, along with the threat of losing my job if I attempted to contact anyone inside the company. Within a day, I received a message notifying me that these serious allegations were being looked into by an officer. The day of my review, Karen looked awfully smug sitting at her desk. Before she could say anything, I handed in my week's notice. By the look on her face, she wasn't expecting it. I told her I couldn't work for a company that showed no concern about its employees. I then let it slip that I'd notified the ministry of the goings-on and everything she had said to me about my job. Not only that, but I had gotten a new job. Now Karen looked nervous. She asked me how much the new position was paying me, and I answered that it was more than I was currently getting paid. She said she would talk to her boss and see if I could get a raise, but only if I dismissed the case. I shrugged and told her now that an officer was assigned to the case, it was out of my hands. My last two weeks were spent watching Karen try and order last-minute safety equipment and create rules that should have been there from the start. Because I no longer work there, the Ministry of Labor no longer updates me on every development. However, the last email I received from the officer who looked into the case assured me legal action was being taken, especially since other employees had stepped forward and reported injuries that Karen also refused to document. And our last story. Oh, I'll dig your trench for you, sir. No problem. 
A guy I served with was on an infantry exercise with this well-known total douche of an officer. No one liked this guy, for several good reasons, including that he had a complete little big man syndrome. He'd been giving them grief the whole time. They really, really did not like this guy. Officers need to be able to lead the mission, but also look after their soldiers. A bad officer can make things pretty miserable. Now the guy was pretty short, around 5'6 or so, but it's not a big deal as long as you do your job, which this guy also sucked at. Anyway, he had to go off to O Group and he threw a shovel at one of his soldiers and said, Dig my trench for me, and left. Okay, fine. The guy was a monster, about 6'5 or so, and he dug a trench. He dug one so deep that the other guys had to help him out when it was done. Late that night, the O Group is done and the little officer is on his way back. Everyone's on the defensive and being quiet and tactical. So he creeps up and asks where his trench is. They point out the glow sticks that are marking the spot. The guy carefully heads over and hops in. Whoosh! Gone. He can't yell for help, since they're all on the defensive and being quiet. He can't climb out very well, especially in the dark. He could not do anything except wait for morning when they were allowed to stand down and the guys came to pull him out. Apparently, he did a better job looking after his troops after that. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next one.